every day. Hospitals, EMS services, and lay people across the globe use Zoll products to save lives. Well, thanks, Winsen, for inviting me to come and share here today. Um, although I, I'm not an emergency room physician, I'm an intensivist, I think there's a lot of areas where emergency medicine and critical care overlap, and I think we have a lot to learn from each other, and I certainly enjoy hearing from the emergency physicians in our conferences. I think the areas of overlap are, are, are particularly uh, common in the area of sepsis. And perhaps that's because of some of the things we're taught about treating our sepsis patients, right? We're taught that those few hours, those first few hours are so important that we have to recognize it early, that we have to get those antibiotics in early, that we have to meet those resuscitation goals early, usually within the first six hours. And, and this can only happen if the process starts before the patient gets to the ICU has to start, for many patients, in the emergency room. So I think there's a lot of overlap. Now this talk title um, refers to a different talk to the talk I'm now going to give today. Um, I felt a, a title with new evidence and sepsis in it could not ignore what happened this week. And what happened this week on Monday, our Twitter, our Facebook, our email filled up with the new sepsis 3 definitions. So after a minor panic attack and calming down, <laughs> I deleted all my original slides and decided, look, we've got to talk about this. It, it, it's relevant and we all need to know about it. So I guess the first question we have to think about is, do we, do we actually need a new definition? I was pretty happy with the old definition. Why are you suddenly coming along and giving me a new definition? But then I thought about it more, and I'd ask you to think about this too, is are you happy with the definition, or are you just comfortable with the definition? And when I stepped back after to reading the new, new definitions, I thought, well, actually, I'm probably comfortable more than I'm happy. And let me explain why I think that. Maybe you, I mean, you're all admitting patients, you're all seeing patients with sepsis. Maybe I just ask you to think about the last patient that you walked up to in that hospital gurney or that hospital bed, and you looked at them and you thought, this patient has sepsis until proven otherwise. Just think about the, the features of the patient that make you think that, okay? And then think about the sepsis criteria, the, you know, fulfilling two of the SERS criteria plus an infection. And just think about who meets those criteria. And as we think about that, maybe we should think about, for me, I sort of thought about the last time I got a bit of a erty, right? I got a fever, um, runny nose, so I took some Sudafed, Goodness knows what my heart rate was after I took the Sudafed. And I had a viral infection. So, you know, I'm sitting at home taking Sudafed, drinking fluids, taking some paracetamol, and I'm sort of meeting the definition of sepsis. But I would never consider myself to have sepsis in that setting. I don't think any of us would. Well, except maybe if I'm trying to get some sympathy for my wife, I might, might draw attention to that. So what I'm trying to get you to think about is maybe the, the current definitions are not great, although we're just familiar with them and we're comfortable with them. So how did our current definitions come into being? How did sepsis and SERS get thrown together? And it really comes back to the, the first definitions, which we're now being encouraged to think of as sepsis 1. So sepsis-1 definitions were a result of this consensus conference in 1991. We're probably all familiar with it. What they did in this meeting was they married SERS and sepsis. And I don't want to be overcritical of these definitions because they've done a huge amount for sepsis and critical care medicine and emergency medicine over the last 25 years. 
So they put us on a pathway, but maybe it's time that we re-luck. The marriage of sirs and sepsis at that time, I think, just reflects our understanding of, of the biology back then. Now, this is before I was in medical school, so I'm sort of, I can't say that I was around and involved with any of this at the time. But what we thought about sepsis at the time really was, you know, somebody gets an infection and then they get this systemic inflammatory focus on inflammation, the sort of response that's very dysregulated. And then if it causes organ dysfunction, then we think, well, that patient probably has severe sepsis, right? And that's what the definitions tell us. And then if they drop their blood pressure, these patients have septic shock. But this whole idea of SIRS and the, the number of patients that potentially meet SIRS, like me after some Sudafed and a bit of a fever, starts to make us get a bit maybe uncomfortable with the definition. And this is not a new idea. So many of us will probably be familiar with this classic letter by Jean-Louis Vincent in 1997. Already, just a few years after the sepsis one definitions came out, we were in this mode of, look, we're not really happy. And some of us can say we're not happy. If you're Jean-Louis Vincent, right, you can stand up there and go, I'm sorry, sirs, I just don't like you. And the reason we don't like it, right, is because it's probably too sensitive. And there's some data that backs this up. So this is a study that was done in a hospital in Iowa. It's published in 1995. It was one of the early sort of studies that tries to look at where, where SERS is going, what does SERS mean, what's the natural history of SERS. And the key thing I want you to take from this slide is the proportion of patients that were admitted to this hospital that fulfilled two or more SERS criteria. It's a huge proportion. It's more than two-thirds of the patients that were admitted to hospital. And this isn't just ICU. This is general ward, surgical ward, and ICU. Two-thirds of the patients fulfilled two or more of the SERS criteria. So it's pretty darn sensitive. Uh, this, is a, this is a beautiful Mac versus PC fail. Um, what this slide is showing is a similar study. It's published around the same time. It's an Italian study. But they just focused on ICU instead of general wards, surgical wards as well. And you can see, again, they just tried to figure out what proportion of patients has SIRS. And they, they did a bit more and said, well, what proportion of those have sepsis, severe sepsis, septic shock? It's very interesting. Again, you can see, this is actually the sepsis category. This is the severe sepsis, and this is the septic shock category. You can see, again, Two-thirds of the patient fulfill at least two of the SERS criteria admitted to ICU. But not only that, it's not very specific, right? All these patients fulfill SERS, but only this proportion actually have some kind of sepsis-related diagnosis. So we've got a problem, and we identified it pretty early on. So we think, okay, let's, let's deal with this. Let's have sepsis Two, okay? They had a consensus conference, 2001. What did they do with sepsis two? They changed almost nothing. <laughs> All they did was say, well, look, yeah, it's kind of useful, but it's kind of sensitive, and it's not really very specific, but on balance, thanks for the flights, thanks for the the nice lunches where we had our conference, but we're not prepared to change anything yet. <laughs> but what they did do, which I think is quite important, is they drew attention to the fact that when we think of a patient with sepsis, it's, we're not thinking of a patient that fulfills two SERS criteria and has an infection, right? There's all these other things that we're thinking about. And I think it was key that they drew attention to this for us. So what happened after sepsis 2? Well, because they didn't change much, it was still too darn sensitive. 
And this is a, a European study. Some of you may be familiar with it, the SOAP study. What they did was they just did a kind of a snapshot study, one of these you know, ESCIM survey studies. It involved about 200 ICUs. And they looked at the proportion of patients admitted to ICU who fulfilled at least two SERS criteria. Really interesting what they found. And perhaps not surprising, almost 90% of the patients admitted to ICU fulfilled at least two SERS criteria. That's pretty darn sensitive, right? The Australians did something a bit like the Iowa hospital study. They went through their, their database. It, this was a Brisbane hospital. They didn't just focus on ICU. They looked at overall admissions. And perhaps not surprisingly, they found a very similar result to the Iowa hospital, that just over two-thirds of the patients, the Iowa hospital found 68%, this is 67.4% of the patients, fulfill at least two SERS criteria. So let's stop and think about what this means to us. Certainly what this means to me as an intensivist, right, is so 90% of the patients that come to me fulfill at least two of the SERS criteria. But what does that mean? That means any patient I'm taking care of that I think has an infection has sepsis because they all fulfill at least two of the SERS criteria. So as an intensivist, I can ask the question, well, what's the point of SERS, right? If a patient comes to me and they're in the ICU and they get an infection, they have sepsis. So I don't really need SERS criteria, which I think is a reflection of how overly sensitive the SERS criteria are. But it's not that simple because not every patient that has an infection has sepsis. So we, we can't just drop the SERS criteria and not have some other way of identifying those high-risk patients, those patients that we think of when we think of a patient with sepsis. I think there's another sort of problem with this SERS. It, br it brings the attention to inflammation, inflammation, inflammation. But we now know, right, 25 years on, that it's not just inflammatory pathways that are involved. There are some anti-inflammatory pathways that are involved. And what about all our patients that are immunosuppressed, our patients that have just had a bone marrow transplant? Because they can't really mount an inflammatory response does that mean they can never get sepsis? Well, of course not. And a really interesting study that I'm going to show on your next slide was done by the, the ANZIX group. They looked at their, their ICU database. It covered around 170 ICUs in this particular study over a 13-year period. And they asked that very question, you know, are there some patients that, you know, are overly sensitive SERS is actually missing just because they probably don't mount that same kind of inflammatory response. A nice thing about their registry is they have uh, diagnosis codes for sepsis, and they're able to, to pull out the patients that have been diagnosed with sepsis and then go back and look at whether they ever fulfilled SERS criteria. And what was really interesting in this study is they found that one in eight patients did not fulfill SERS criteria, and yet they were diagnosed as having sepsis. I think we can all think of patients we've taken care of that don't really meet SERS criteria. Uh, sorry about that. And um, we've still considered them to have sepsis, maybe our <coughs> neutropenic patients or something that haven't mounted a fever yet. So does SERS have any defense? Well, I think... It must have some defense, right? They didn't drop it in 2001. And I think there is one defense, and that one defense is, this is coming back to the, the SOAP study again, the European study that looked at the, the proportion of patients coming into ICU with SERS. I think the defense is the more SERS criteria you fulfill, the more likely you are to die. So it must have some role, right? It's got some usefulness. The more SERS criteria you meet, the more likely you are to die. So it has, has some role in helping us sort these patients out, figure out who's going to die, who's the sickest. 
And this was also seen way back in that 1995 um, Iowa hospital study. You can see the more SERS criteria you meet, the higher your mortality. But because we've got this upsloping mortality, you have to ask the question, well, how did you come up with two? Why not one? Why not three? Why not four? And I think that becomes very relevant when you consider this slide from the, the ANZIC study. You can see here, number of SERS criteria met, odds of death. There's no real big step up between one and two, right? What, what separates a one patient from a two patient other than our our definition, there's not a massive difference in the odds of death. Maybe two to three. In fact, looking at this slide, I would probably make a stronger argument that we should use three SERS criteria, not, not two, because we want to pick out the patients that have an infection that we think have sepsis because we think they're more likely to die, right? That, that's really what we mean by a patient with sepsis. We mean someone who's got an infection who's so sick that we're worried they're going to die. But this, kind, this, this slide from the same ANZIC study also starts to put a nail, an additional nail in the coffin of SERS because the black dots represent the mortality for each year for the patients that had sepsis and fulfilled SERS criteria. The clear dots represent the patients who had sepsis but did not fill, fulfill SERS criteria. And you can see there's not a lot of difference in mortality between those two groups. So what role does SERS really play in helping us? Perhaps not a very big role at all. So we got comfortable with this definition, although we're not entirely happy with it. And maybe we need to reflect and change things. I'm pleased to say that with the sepsis-3 guidelines, I think there's some light at the end of the tunnel now. They've done a few important things, but what they've really done is they've changed this idea sepsis is a syndrome defined by the presence of infection and inflammatory response, and they've changed it to sepsis is life-threatening, so focusing on mortality, and that it's a dysregulated response. Notice there's no reference to inflammation in the new definition. And what does that mean practically? Well, it means they, they threw out SERS criteria and they've replaced it with something that we call the quick sofa. And what is the quick sofa? Damn it, it's something we've got to learn. <laughs> but it's not that hard, and I think it's going to take less learning than the SERS criteria. Because all we need to remember is a respiratory rate cutoff of 22, altered mentation. They did look at GCS and found that GCS and altered mental, altered mental status didn't, there was no benefit of focusing on a particular GCS score. And this keeps it nice and general and easy to remember. A systolic pressure of less than 100. But the other key thing to notice is that that doesn't get you into your definition yet. But how did it perform? Well, they looked at the role of QSOFA. They basically took a four massive data sets, three from the States, one from Germany, and they did a retrospective validation. This was one of the, the papers published alongside the sepsis-3 definitions. You can see the QSOFA, this is the area under the curve. For patients who are not yet in the ICU, this is how well it discriminates for mortality. Pretty good, and certainly better than SERS. It's even better than the, the SOFA score in the, the pre-ICU pre setting, which maybe shouldn't surprise us because the SOFA score was designed for ICU, right? So if you meet two of your quick sofa criteria, to, to reach the sepsis definition, to be defined as having sepsis under the sepsis-3 definition, you have to have evidence of organ dysfunction. And they, you, they're using the sofa score to define this, which I think is where most of us are going to have a bit of a visceral reaction. Because 
what does the sofa score look like? My God, it looks like this. Okay. How that? Th th this is going to take more memory than SIRS for sure. But if we just break it down and say, look, we're going to need two. What do I have to remember? I'm probably only going to have to remember these numbers. Okay. Because if I hit these numbers or higher, then I can be pretty sure I meet a score of two or more, right? So this is damn scary, but if we break it down to just remembering one of the columns becomes a little bit less intimidating. And of course, we all, well, a lot of us are using electronic medical records now, so we can have the system support us with this. How does it perform? Well, in the ICU population, the SOFA score performs not quite as good as the logistic organ dysfunction score, but pretty similar. And we were all more familiar with this, which was their predominant reason for choosing the SOFA. Um, and of course, as we'd expect, and as we've seen with SIRS, these nonspecific things become less useful once the patient's sick enough to be heading towards the ICU. So if a patient has evidence of organ dysfunction, and we're starting out with a patient who we think has an infection rather than the other way around, looking at the, the parameters, do they have SIRS and then do they have an infection, we can define them as having sepsis. And look, there's no severe sepsis. And why is that? It's because really, when we think of a patient with sepsis, we think of somebody who's got sick enough to have some form of organ dysfunction. So they just really have replaced, they've dropped sepsis and we really replace severe sepsis with sepsis because that's what we really think about when we think of a, a patient with sepsis. And then they went on to, of course, you can't define sepsis without defining septic shock. And they did a, I mean, this was a huge exercise. They did a separate consensus review to come up with the septic shock. Now, the the sepsis, the Q-SOFA and the SOFA, they were able to, to validate in hospital data sets. This was a bit more tricky, and there's a bit more consensus opinion on this. They used a process called the Delphi process, which you can see she's just held the three-minute thing up, so I'm not going to have time to describe that. But what they essentially did was broke, they, they looked at all the data out there, and they broke patients up into different groups of how you could describe septic shock. And they came up with these five different groups. And the one that most people were favoring in their consensus definition was that the patient's got to be properly resuscitated. And if they're properly fluid resuscitated, but they're still needing some kind of vasopressor therapy, then we think they're in shock. And they need to have a lactate greater than two. And if you fulfill those two criteria, then you meet the new definition of septic shock. And you can see that that criteria, compared to the other ones they reviewed, predicts mortality better or discriminates or identifies those patients with septic shock that are more likely to die compared to the other criteria. These are all less likely to die. So there we have it. This is sepsis 3. This was a revised talk um, the last couple of days. What I like about it, patient was starting out, I think this patient's got an infection, rather than starting out with SERS criteria. I like the Q-SOFA better than the SERS, less to remember, and it's area under the curve for patients that haven't hit the ICU yet is better. But what I also like about it is you don't necessarily have to have it if you're really suspicious. But then you go on to look for evidence of organ dysfunction, and they're recommending we use the SOFA score. And we need to figure out processes of simplifying this for us. And then, of course, meeting the definition of septic shock. So what does this mean for us? I think it means, yes, excellent. We can say goodbye, sirs. We are... Uh, we liked you, we got comfortable with you, but I don't think we're going to miss you. For us in this room, we go back to work on Monday, we can start talking about our colleagues. No one's done prospective validation for this yet. 
maybe we should start thinking about doing a bit of work, collecting some data, trying to prospectively validate these new definitions. What does this mean in Southeast Asia? We have a huge range of resource settings, right? And how will the SOFA perform in a resource setting that maybe doesn't have the access to labs that the Europeans and the Americans were thinking about when they came up with these definitions? And finally, I didn't put it up there, but what does this mean in a patient that has a pre-existing organ dysfunction? Thank you very much.